Hello and welcome to this video Bible class entitled Faith Within a Frame, uh, how Christian art proclaims and interprets God's word. Why a Bible class on Christian art? Well, there's a number of purposes for Christian art. Uh, the first one is to educate the faithful about Bible history. Uh, there are a lot of Christians uh, today in America, but there's not a whole lot of biblical literacy. Uh, people might know some of the more famous uh, stories of the Bible, but they don't really know them that well. And so hopefully we can use art and uh, we can use the images that artists have come up with over the centuries to educate you about what uh, some of the basic Bible stories are and to get you thinking about them on a deeper level. Next purpose is to aid the faithful in visualizing how God works in and among his people. Uh, when you read the Bible, you have your own mental pictures of what happens and uh, what these people look like and where they went and what the scenery, what the background scenery looked like. Well, you're not the only one to have that visualization. Artists also have that visualization. Uh, the thing is, they put theirs down on canvas or on wood or on other materials. And so the artist is not just uh, telling you the story. He's also, or she is also, interpreting the story for you, getting you to look at the story perhaps a different way than maybe you you did not look at it before. Another purpose for Christian art is to move the emotions of the Christian to a deeper religious experience. Uh, sometimes we conservative Lutherans are, are a little bit of afraid of emotions, but God created us with emotions and emotions can be good. And certainly art has the purpose of impacting your emotions. Uh, I, I think one big example comes from movies. Uh, many of you a long time ago when it first came out, about 15 years ago, saw uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. Uh, very gory, very bloody movie, but very accurate. And I don't think anybody could really watch that movie without having a number of emotional reactions. And that's what art does. Uh, we're not going to be looking at movies. We're going to be looking at, at still uh, paintings. Uh, but yet uh, the emotions uh, that the artists want to create are still there and still valuable. Another thing we want to do is stimulate a Christian's intellect to a broader understanding of God's word. When you look at a piece of Christian art and compare it to the Bible story, you're going to have to think about it, not just feel, but also think about it. How does this artist uh, interpret God's word? Is he doing a good job of interpreting God's word? Are there some, some false doctrines that might be presented uh, or are, danger, or are danger, uh, in this piece of art? So we have to think about God's word, and that's one very good purpose of Christian art. Another thing that Christian art can do is foster unity among God's people. And I think particularly of uh, my congregation here, uh, St. John's Lutheran Church in Oak Creek. Uh, when you come to our church and worship in our church, you see a number of uh, different art pieces of artwork. You have the statue of Jesus right in the middle. Then on either side of the chancel, you have Jesus uh, knocking on the door. You have Jesus, the good shepherd, on the other side. And then above the chancel, you have Jesus, the Lamb of God from the book of Revelation. And that, that one the, of Jesus, the Lamb of God, uh, from the book of Revelation, looking as if he had been slain but come back to life, that's really the, the logo of our congregation. So when people see that, that painting... Uh, and they're familiar with it, they identify with St. John's. And so art can do that. It can unite a group of people around a single theme. And finally, uh, Christian art proclaims the faith to unbelievers. <clears throat> uh, there are a lot of churches uh, out there that uh, are, well, are empty, and not just because of uh, coronavirus lockdowns. Uh, if you go to Europe, uh, if you go to America, and you go to large churches, you'll see that they're, they're pretty empty because people aren't worshiping there. But tourists love to go to uh, churches and also to art galleries, and they see a lot of Christian art there. And so they wonder, well, what's this story about? And maybe they'll read a little uh, explanation of it, and in that way uh, they come into contact with God's Word. Of course, that's not the main way of proclaiming God's Word, but it is a supportive way of proclaiming God's Word, and perhaps as you get to uh, understand and appreciate Christian art more, you can incorporate that into your evangelism outreach. Big question, though, what is art? Uh, but is it art? How do you know what art is? Well, uh, the Bible never gives an exact definition for Christian art, but I think St. Paul comes close in, in Philippians chapter 4, where he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, 
Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the peace of God will be with you. Now notice that Paul uses the word whatever quite a lot, and that means that there are no rules in the Bible as to how Christian art has to go, just like we have no rules how we must worship. Uh, we have a lot of freedom in our Christian faith, in our New Testament Christian faith. Um, but yet, even though we have freedom, doesn't mean we can do exactly whatever we please. Uh, there are guidelines. There are things that, there are, there are well, you might even say rules, uh, that direct how we use our freedom. And, and St. Paul says, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Now, the thing about that, all that, though, is those are all rather subjective terms. Uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, it's said, and, and again, nobility, uh, what is right, uh, purity, lovely, admirable, those are all rather subjective terms, some more than others. Um, so that means that we're not all agreed on what is or isn't good art, and that's, and that's fine. Uh, you might like a type of artwork that somebody else doesn't like. Uh, uh, that other person might like work, artwork that, that you don't like. But even though there's a, a, a great realm of subjectivity, of personal opinion in, in how you view art and evaluating art, uh, there are still are uh, standards among experts, people who have studied art, people who have really looked at art, people who have, uh, uh, again, uh, not just studied it, but, but spent careers examining pieces of art and seeing the history of art and, and being artists themselves. Now, these people who are very well educated um, know, know their art. And so they can come up with uh, general guidelines as to what good art is. Now, hopefully, I will stick to those general guidelines of what good art is. Moving on, uh, how we're going to do this. Uh, this particular lesson has a, a longer introduction. Uh, just to get you familiar with how I'm going to do things and why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, the other lessons will be much more focused on Bible stories and artwork to enhance those Bible stories. But for now, uh, how does class typically go? Well, I'll introduce Bible story. I'll read the story from the Bible or portions of the story. I might summarize uh, parts of the Bible for you. Then I'll show you artwork, sometimes just one painting, maybe a couple of paintings uh, that will... Uh, Again, help you understand the story a little bit better. I'll comment on a little bit of the art, but I'm no art historian, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then the big thing is we'll evaluate how uh, well the artist did in interpreting the scriptures, proclaiming the truth of what God's word says. And then uh, we'll close with a short prayer. A little bit about myself, uh, Pastor Dale Rexon, I hear at St. John's Lutheran Church in Oak Creek, South 27th Street on Oakwood Drive. We often go by the name St. John's Oakwood. Uh, I am not, and I repeat this, I am not uh, formally or professionally trained in art history. I have never taken an art history or art appreciation class in my life. I am truly an amateur. Uh, amateur is actually a French word, which, mean, which means somebody who loves something. I, I love art, but I am not an expert. And so I'm going to kind of stay away from what an expert would normally talk about, the style, uh, the 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 methods, how they're imitating another artist, or you know, uh, how they're using the various techniques of the day in art. So I'm kind of going to stay away from that. I also do want to say, though, that since I'm an amateur, a lover of art, I have my biases and my prejudices. I will let you know right up front that I like uh, art from the uh, high Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, pre-Renaissance, Renaissance, post-Renaissance, post -Renaissance, and Reformation era. Uh, th those are things that I, I like because a lot of that art is Christian art. I'm not so wild about what came afterwards, the Age of Enlightenment, uh, the, the modern era, the Romantic era. Um, not a big fan of that kind of art. But again, there are many, many exceptions uh, to those two general rules that I, I talked about. Um, my formal training. I'm not an art historian, not an art critic, so why am I doing this? Well, because I'm a pastor. I've been trained in scripture interpretation and how to teach the scripture. And that's what this class is really all about. It's mostly about teaching you the stories from God's word and using God's word to 
increase your faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ, our Savior. I'm uh, trained in Lutheran theology, which means I will look at things from a confessional, conservative, Lutheran point of view. Um, sometimes that will be the general Christian point of view, but sometimes uh, we'll look at uh, pieces of art that are definitely Catholic or definitely Reformed, and I'll point out the, the theological differences uh, at that time. Uh, I've had a, uh, a lot of studies in Western culture, and I'll make no apology for it. I am Western in my thought, in my thinking, in my outlook, in my worldview. Uh, by Western, I mean uh, we are heirs of the ancient Greek civilization, ancient Roman civilization, of European Middle Ages, and uh, you might even say European colonialism, uh, very rooted in the history of the Western world, again, particularly Europe. I've also had biblical, classical, and theological language training, uh, Hebrew, Greek, uh, Latin, and German. And you might think, well, why does that have anything to do with art? Well, it does because both language and art are Thing, are things that, that cultures use to express themselves. And even though there might be a subtle connection, there's definitely a connection there because how a culture, how a, an era uses language or uses art is a reflection of how they view things, including how they view God's word. Uh, so when you understand uh, uh, an, an artist's cultural and linguistic historical background, you can kind of see where that artist is coming from and that helps you interpret uh, the, 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 the piece of art you're looking at. Now my informal training, why I feel uh, at least uh, somewhat qualified uh, to talk about art is again that I, it's one of my big hobbies. Uh, over the last uh, 30 years I've had the privilege of traveling a lot, uh, visited uh, some of the world-class art museums in Europe and in North America, and I also like visiting uh, churches in my, in my travels, and uh, churches also like art to proclaim God's word. And uh, there's a lot of art in churches. So uh, I've spent a lot of time just uh, looking at art and falling in love with it and studying it and reading about it and uh, looking uh, through art, uh, art books and, and things like that. I'm also uh, familiar with several Romance languages, namely French, uh, Spanish, Italian, and so on, like Catalan and Portuguese also. I'm not an expert in these languages, but again, I understand where those languages uh, are coming from, and that helps me, I believe, understand and appreciate those artists who come from countries like France and Italy and Spain. A little bit of a warning here. Uh, this is uh, mostly G, PG rated, but there are going to be some pictures that we're going to be looking at that have nudity in them, uh, particularly Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden because that's how God made them without any clothes on. Uh, the artist is going to depict that uh, and you know, there will be nudity. There will also be violence. A prime example would be uh, King David cutting Goliath's head off. Um, it's not done. I, I don't put these pictures up there and artists didn't do it just for shock value, uh, just to you know, get a sensation, but quite honestly to be faithful to scripture because the, this is how scripture describes the human experience. It's not, all, it's not all pleasant, it's not all roses. Uh, there's some pretty nasty things that happened. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at that. Um, this may offend you, uh, this may offend your children, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to warn you when nudity or vi extreme violence is coming up. I won't always remember to do that though, so parents, you might wanna preview this. Uh, but again, use, use your discretion. So with that introduction, let's uh, go to the introduction of the Bible or the beginning of the Bible to creation. And there's a number of uh, <clears throat> problems that an artist will come across when an artist tries to depict creation. The first one is, how do you paint the nothingness that existed before creation? Uh, somebody might say, well, just paint black on a canvas. Well, that doesn't really work because black is a concept and a canvas is a concept and paint is a concept. Uh, remember, there was nothing uh, that existed except God before God started creating. Uh, that leads us to another uh, difficulty in, in Christian art. How do you depict God? God is spirit. Yes, uh, God uh, became <clears throat> human in the person of Jesus Christ. We'll talk a lot more about that. A lot of Christian art has to do with that. Uh, but God the Father, well, you're going to have to use artistic license. And many artists do that. And uh, in the first few centuries of the Christian church, uh, artists uh, really shied away from and did not try to depict God the Father in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there's a long history of that, but around the year 800, 900, 
uh, Christian artists started using like the, the hand of God as a symbol for God. And then it gradually developed that, that artists uh, depicted God usually as a human being. And generally, to show the attributes of God, artists paint God as an old man, because God is eternal and eternity is a long time, as a powerful man, since God is omnipotent, he is all-powerful, and as a wise man, because God is all-knowing. Uh, sometimes artists will also uh, depict God, the Creator, God the Father, as Jesus Christ. And that's quite good theology to uh, picture uh, God as Jesus Christ because, well, Jesus Christ is God in flesh. But we'll talk a little bit about that more in later lessons. So let's go to the beginning of the Bible. And I encourage you to, uh, to read along in your Bibles. I'll read the text. The text will be on, on the video screen uh, sometimes it's good to, to just read in your Bible. Also, another uh, point I should have told you, you can download uh, this presentation, or I, I, hope you, I hope we can make it downloadable, uh, so you can follow along uh, on the outline. Let's start with uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was undeveloped and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. He separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning the first day. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, and let it separate the water from the water. God made the expanse. And he separated the water that was below the expanse from the water that was above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. There was evening and there was morning the second day. Our first picture that we're going to look at comes from one of the world's most famous art uh, pieces of art. Or, uh, uh, yeah, pieces of art. And that is from the Sistine Chapel uh, in, in the Vatican, uh, Vatican City. A, uh, that's where the popes get elected, but Michelangelo is, is very famous for painting uh, that, that Sistine Chapel ceiling. And this is a real close-up of one of the first frames where it's God dividing light from darkness. And you can see here God uh, as an old man, he's got that gray beard, uh, and we can see that because we're, we're looking up to God. Uh, we see God as looking from below, not just because we're on the floor of the Sistine Chapel, and the Sistine Chapel is about uh, 30 feet uh, above, the, the ceiling's about 30 feet above the floor, but uh, Michelangelo is saying you have to look up at God, and uh, that's what we're doing. That's the, the, the angle he gives us. Also notice that, that God's in pretty good shape. God's got a lot of good muscles. God has good muscle tone, even for a guy with a, a gray beard. Uh, again, this shows us God's power. Uh, one thing I really appreciate, appreciate about how Michelangelo did this, though, uh, look at where the brightest light is. The, the whitest part of the painting is around God's head uh, to show that the mind of God, the word of God, uh, God's essence is uh, light and life. Uh, with his left arm, God is holding up the light, and with his right hand, he is pushing away the darkness. And uh, again, this is a, an artistic depiction of what God the Spirit did, uh, but I think Michelangelo does a pretty good job of, of, telling, of uh, informing our minds about uh, how God does his work. Next section, we'll go on uh, to how God created other things. God said, <clears throat> let the waters under the sky be gathered together to one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. The waters under the sky gathered to their own places, and the dry land appeared. God called the dry ground land, and the gathering places of the waters he called seas. God saw that it was good. God said, let the earth produce plants, vegetation that produces seed, and trees that bear fruit with its seed in it, each according to its own kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth plants, vegetation that produces seed according to its own kind, and trees that bear fruit with its seed in it, each according to its own kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to divide the day from the night, 
and let them serve as markers to indicate seasons, days, and years. Let them serve as lights in the expanse of the sky to give light to the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He also made the stars. God set the lights in place in the expanse of the sky to provide light for the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good, there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. I've highlighted how God made the two great lights, the sun and the moon, and uh, for a picture of that, we return to the Sistine Chapel and Michelangelo painting God creating the sun and the moon. I think you can tell which is which. But, you know, here we have uh, God, again, depicted very similar to how he was in the first painting. I think his beard is a little bit longer in this painting. Uh, but again, it's a gray beard. God's still dressed in red robes, and he's in, in very good shape, very powerful. The look on his face is one of great concentration. God did not take uh, upon himself to create the, the universe, the world, as a whim, as something like a hobby. God put, him, put his whole self into his creation, uh, both uh, figuratively and, and again later on, literally. Uh, you can see that this is an action picture, even though it's a still. Uh, God's robes are ruffling uh, because things are moving. Uh, God's doing some big work here, and uh, Michelangelo depicts it uh, with those, those ruffled robes. The next picture we're going to show uh, is another picture of God the Father, painted by a contemporary of Michelangelo, and uh, that uh, painter is Raphael. Uh, they lived about the same time. They worked in the same areas. They knew each other. Uh, this is uh, entitled, uh, God the Father Blessing Among the Angels. It's about uh, 1520 or so it was painted, and uh, it is uh, in the Louvre Museum in Paris right now. Even though it was painted in Rome, uh, it is now in Paris. Uh, art tends to, to move around like that. Uh, and again, look what uh, uh, this time Raphael does to, to show the, the glory, the transcendence, the power of God. God is sitting in the clouds. Uh, on either side of God, you have red and then dark red, light and night. You have an arch. God's in an arch, the arch of the heavens. And there are angels on either side of him. Let's take a, a closer look, though, uh, to that picture of God. Uh, now, the angels are in that, and the Bible never tells us when the angels were created. But we know it had to be between the first day of creation and the sixth day of creation because in Genesis 1.1, it says that, you know, in the beginning God created everything that exists. And then uh, Genesis, uh, at the end of Genesis chapter 1, it says that God had finished all he had done creating. So sometime in those six days of creation, God created the angels. We don't know exactly when. The Bible doesn't say. Um, Again, and if you go back to the other picture of God, you'll see that Raphael and Michelangelo were contemporaries, and they also have very many similarities in how they depict God. Uh, you have God dressed in red and blue robes. You have him bearded. You have him old. Uh, you have him uh, uh, in the clouds. So a uh, very common theme. They each had their own special style, but they pretty much, uh, you can tell they come from the same place in the same era. But now we're going to move back about 300 years to God as the architect of the world. Uh, this uh, was done by an unknown artist, like I said, before the year 1300. We really don't know the names of the artists. Um, it's part of a manuscript of the Bible, uh, which is basically, uh, well, they didn't have printing presses back in the 1200s or the 1100s, or uh, this is about 1225. Uh, so everything had to be done by hand. And the monks copied the text of the scripture, but to make it look really nice, they put in these elaborate drawings. Now, uh, I don't know how much be, uh, a Bible like this would be worth in today's dollars, but I can imagine it'd be over $100,000 uh, for, for something like this, because it took, it took lots and lots of time, over a year, to produce one copy of the Bible. Very beautiful copy of the Bible, but still only one copy of the Bible. Uh, currently, this uh, piece of artwork, even though it was drawn in Paris, is now in uh, Vienna, Austria. Like I said, art tends to travel. Uh, if you look closely uh, down at the bottom, you see God's right foot is outside of the frame of the, uh, of the picture. 
And so that, that kind of tells us that God is outside of his creation, but God is now stepping in to creation. God is stepping into the material world to create it. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting uh, to show that, that God's in motion here. Uh, now, another big thing that you might notice in here besides God and the, the, the world that he's working on is a very large compass. And that's interesting because uh, although the compass has been around for a long, long time, uh, around the year 1200, 1150, uh, the art and the skill of masonry really took off. And that allowed uh, the Christian church in Western Europe to build huge, huge churches, uh, Gothic cathedrals with their, their soaring uh, height, with their flying buttresses, tall steeples, and uh, stained glass windows. Uh, it took sometimes hundreds and hundreds of years to build, uh, but it wouldn't have been built without developments in architecture. And again, I'm not an architect, but I do know that the compass was used uh, by architects at that time, by builders at that time, to be able to uh, really advance uh, the, the style and the skill of building around that time. So an artist would naturally be aware of that uh, because the artist would be a monk in the church and he might have been in the church that was being built at the time. So he would see these builders using uh, the compass. And so God is going to use a compass to draw that perfect circle of his creation. Uh, and again, a circle is a perfect form. It's, uh, and it, it, it's a symbol for God, uh, God's e uh, eternity, uh, without beginning, without end. But it's also a symbol, again, like I said, of perfection. So God created a perfect world, and he's using uh, that, that instrument of the compass to, to make it perfect. Uh, and it shows us that, that there's no conflict in the year 1225 between faith and science. Uh, faith says, well, God used, uh, he didn't have to use a compass, but God used the rules of geometry uh, to make his world. And the world fits together beautifully because God was a great designer. Now, notice something, though, that this artist doesn't have perfect chronology uh, because uh, the sun and moon are created and it's, uh, the sun is the, the red, uh, excuse me, the yellow little ball in between the, the two points of the compass. And just to the uh, upper right, or upper left, excuse me, upper left of the sun is the moon, the little black dot. I have no idea what that red thing is on the other side. But you don't have any, uh, so sun and moon were created on day four, created on day four, but the plants and the dry land were created on day three, and this artist doesn't have any dry land or any plants on that, that golden glob in the middle out of which God was going to you know, fine tune his creation. Uh, and again, the unformed matter is the, the world in the middle uh, of which God is going to make his creation. And it shows us that uh, they were very geocentric, that they thought that the, the earth was the center of the universe. Um, they thought that the, the sun and everything and the stars and the planets all rotated around the sun. We know that's not true anymore. Uh, never was true. Next slide, I'm going to compare uh, between 300 years. The one on the left is the one we just looked at. Uh, from about 1225. The one on the right is what we looked at before by uh, Raphael, and um, about 1515, I believe. So roughly 300 years separates these two paintings. And you can see some, some key differences. The older one, uh, the manuscript from France, is, uh, is very two-dimensional. It's, it's very uh, stiff compared with the, the, the other one by Raphael. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of... Uh, 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 there's not a whole lot of what I call uh, movement, uh, dynamism in that. But in Raphael, you've got God moving his hands. You've got the robes uh, flowing more with a lot more air in them. Uh, and uh, you just get a sense that, that, that art has, had gone places, had developed into a finer, uh, finer craft by the year 1515, by the Renaissance. Uh, but yet, even though there's some, some noticeable differences, there's also some similarities. One is that God's wearing blue and ro red robes, and they are ruffled and they're, they're fluttered. Uh, God is presented as a human being, uh, greater than all, all existence. Um, what else? Uh, um, yeah, larger than life. 
So uh, this shows us that over 300 years, which is a long time, uh, art was developing. Even though artists were conventional, that is, they, they followed the same style of drawing God in those robes, drawing God uh, as a human being, uh, they also are evolving. They're, they're always developing new techniques and, and new styles. And, and it, art is kind of like fashion. It, it changes. Now we move to uh, creation on the third day. Uh, this was painted by Hieronymus Bosch uh, from the Low Countries, from the Netherlands, about the year 1500. Uh, right now it's in uh, the Prado Museum in Madrid. Uh, again, art travels. Uh, these are exterior panels to a triptych, and you can tell that it's a exterior panels to a triptych because of that big barrier that goes down the middle. Uh, these are really uh, doors that are going to open up, and inside it will reveal uh, three pictures, one big one in the middle, and then two smaller ones on either side. Uh, triptychs are, are, were very common in the, uh, again, the, the Renaissance and uh, Afterwards, we don't uh, use them a whole lot in our churches, although there are some churches that are, are bringing them back into style. Uh, the top line of this particular uh, painting reads, Ipse dixit et facta sunt, ipse mundavit et creata sunt. That's Latin for uh, God spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast, Psalm 33. So Bosch is, is telling us that, that God is the creator and uh, he's showing us that God's word is how uh, God uh, tells us how he created things. Notice that the earth is surrounded by, by darkness because the sun, the moon, and the stars had not yet been created, but yet there is light. But because there's no sun, uh, no bright light, uh, Bosch definitely goes with the, the kind of the green-gray look uh, to show us that you know, we're, we're, we're not quite there yet with, with creation. Now, uh, this is, again, a triptych, so it opens up, and it opens up to an explosion of color, and we'll take a look at the Garden of Earthly Delights in a later lesson, and you'll, you might be scratching your heads when you see that one, but uh, it, it's quite interesting. Uh, I'm just going to zoom in a little. Oh, wait, uh, on the upper right hand, upper left, excuse me, uh, there's, a, there's a little picture of, of God and showing that God is over his creation. It's kind of weird that I think that God is so small, but... Maybe Bosch is telling us that God is so far away and he's so uh, transcendent and elevated above us that, uh, you know, here on earth, he looks, he looks far away. So next slide is just going to be a close-up of the vegetation. And again, it's, it's not really high def. It's uh, kind of, kind of uh, uh, fuzzy here and there. And you don't see a whole lot of familiar plants in that. And that was by design. Uh, that, that Bosch didn't want us to, uh, or, or Bosch didn't want to say that this was a particular place with this kind of vegetation. He's trying to uh, <clears throat> just basically show us all the earth. Again, this is rather drab, and uh, the next one will show, the next uh, picture will show something that's not drab at all. Uh, the next painting is from days five and six. This is day three. We're going to skip over day four. We're going to go to day five and six. And this is uh, by Tintoretto. And I'm going to read uh, Genesis chapter one, the fifth and the sixth day. God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures and let birds and other winged creatures fly above the earth in the open expanse of the sky. God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their own kind, and every winged bird according to its own kind. God saw that it was good. God blessed them when he said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters of the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. God said, Let the earth produce living creatures according to their own kind, livestock, creeping things, and wild animals according to their own kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their own kind and the livestock according to their own kind and everything that creeps on the ground according to its own kind. God saw that it was good. Now, if you uh, again take a look at it, it's uh, much more brilliant and vibrant than the, the previous painting we looked at. It's probably 
uh, the most uh, dynamic, brilliant uh, picture we've looked at so far. And that makes sense because uh, Tintoretto painted around 1550, so about 30 years after uh, Michelangelo and Raphael. Uh, not that Michelangelo and Raphael were incapable of painting something as dynamic, but uh, the Renaissance era, the high Renaissance, late Renaissance, was um, a very uh, dynamic time. Things were changing very, very quickly. Uh, in, in the Reformation, the Lutheran Church uh, was, uh, was, was born and developed its, its theology. Uh, but getting back to this painting here, God is not you know, far, far away, but he is right there in the middle of his creation. Uh, but he's not walking on ground, if you notice. He's, he's suspended in air to show that he is, he is not really human. He's, he's God, but he's surrounded by his creation. You see that uh, Tintoretto follows the same uh, stock imagery of God that we've seen so far. Uh, blue and red robes that are flowing to show the motion. Uh, God is an old man with that, that gray beard. If you uh, look at God's right hand, he's, he's you know, basically kind of like forcing life out. And so there you have the birds. Go down to the sea, and if you are uh, looking at it really, really closely, again, uh, I don't know how the resolution is on this video presentation, but I would encourage you, if you're interested, to uh, search for this online, and you'll find uh, pictures with uh, much, much higher resolution. But uh, Tintoretto was from Venice, and Venice is on the Adriatic Sea. Venice was a seafaring empire, and so there's a lot of seafood in Venice even to this day. Uh, Tintoretto uh, paints all these different types of, of fish and uh, sea creatures that I have no idea what they are, but just that how everyone is, is different. And uh, Tintoretto was showing us that, that God did create a lot of different uh, kinds and species. Again, I'm not a biologist, so I apologize if I made a mistake in that terminology. Uh, but again, Tintoret, uh, Tintoretto combines day four, or excuse me, day five, the creation of the sea and the air creatures with the first part of day six, the creation of the land animals. And if you look up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see some birds, but you'll also see a, a horse's head. But notice what's coming out of the horse's head, the white horse, and, and that is a horn. So uh, Tintoretto put a unicorn in this picture uh, because that was a very popular thing to do uh, during this time of painting, uh, put a unicorn in, in creation paintings. Um, creation in this picture is following God's command, where it said, God blessed them. When he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Uh, so we have Tintoretto's version of God creating animals and life. And we're going to skip over these next two slides because I read them for you. And now we're going to go to our final picture, uh, the creation, which is actually eight pictures. It's in a manuscript, so it's in a, it's in a printed copy of the Bible or a hand hand-copied copy of the Bible, where you have artists drawing Bible stories on the margins, sometimes on the full page. Uh, again, we don't know who did this, uh, probably in, in France. It is still in France. Uh, it, this summarizes Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, and Genesis 3, verses 1 through 8. Uh, so we're getting a little bit ahead of the story here with this one. Now again, such a, an illuminated Bible like this, illuminated means it's, it's illustrated, it's got pictures in it, uh, would be would cost a fortune. Like I, I threw out the term hundred thousand dollars. I I just I just don't know. Um, but I'm going to go and give you a close up of each of the frames. I'm going to kind of break it in two, so you can kind of see what panel one, panel two, panel three, and just uh, briefly touch on what each panel is talking about. Panel number one, God creates light. And the spirit hovers over the face of the waters. You can see right before, below God, you have the dove, uh, who is the, the image of the, the, the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's safe to paint uh, the Holy Spirit as a dove because the Bible itself says uh, in, in John chapter 3, or excuse me, when, um, when Jesus gets baptized, that the Holy Spirit uh, showed up in the form of a dove, Pentecost also. Uh, and then in panel 1, I'm, I have to admit that I don't know who the two people are uh, that God's holding in his hands. Uh, I just don't know. Uh, Adam and Eve, maybe? I don't know. Uh, day two, God creates, uh, separates waters from the sky, 
And uh, what do you do? Uh, you, you make a rainbow. Now, uh, we normally think of rainbows uh, as, up as the other way around, but remember God's looking down on his creation, and so uh, God is giving the rainbow, uh, and we're the recipients of the rainbow, so we're going to see it from a different angle that God does. Uh, so that's what the artist wanted to show, that, that God is the giver of the rainbow, we're the recipient of the rainbow, even though the rainbow isn't mentioned, of course, until uh, the story of Noah. It's, it's a good uh, way of teaching uh, that God separated the light from the darkness. Panel three, uh, God gathers the waters together, creates land and vegetation. And it might be uh, rather simplistic, not nearly as sophisticated as the Renaissance, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the artist gets his point across. God is up there in heaven, and he is uh, creating dry land and vegetation. Panel four, uh, God creates the sun and the moon. And I really like this panel because he's uh, holding the sun and the moon in his hands. And the sun is actually smaller than the moon, um, but that makes sense because uh, back in 1225, uh, that's what, it, I mean, it still looks the same today. You look up into the sky at night, the moon is, is bigger, it appears bigger than the sun. We know why, but they didn't back then. Uh, but the artist depicts the, the sun and the moon in opposite sizes. And it's also holding the sun and the moon in his hand. You know, we like to sing that, that, that children's song, he's got the whole world in his hands. Well, he's got the sun and the moon and the stars and everything else in his hands too. God is the almighty creator of all things. Going to panel five, God creates the creatures of the sky and the sea. Again, not as dynamic as the last picture we looked at, but still gets the point across very well uh, that that's what God uh, created. And then panel six, God created the land animals. And uh, panel seven is uh, God created Adam and Eve. And then panel eight is Adam and Eve being tempted into sin. We're going to talk about uh, the creation of Adam and Eve uh, a lot more in the next lesson, and uh, I'm not sure, because I haven't written the lesson yet, if we're going to get to the temptation. But uh, I will give you that, that warning uh, that uh, in, the next, uh, in the next lesson, we're going to take a look at the creation, which means a lot of uh, pictures of Adam and Eve in the nude. Uh, so that's uh, historically, biblically accurate. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, this would be normally if this were a live Bible class uh, where I'd ask the, the, the class if they had any questions. Obviously, um, that's not we're not live streaming this. This is a video recording. But if you do have questions and you'd like to talk about anything that I said in this lesson, uh, challenge me, question me, uh, correct me, uh, whatever, uh, you can uh, use the church website to use uh, get my contact information. You can text me, you can call me, you can email me, and I'll try my best to answer any questions you might have. Uh, let's close with a, a brief prayer. Dear Father in heaven, all praise, glory, and thanks be to you from all your creation. In your great power, in your great wisdom, you created the heavens and the earth. You made this world beautiful. You made this world perfect because you are perfect. Again, as we look at the creation you made us, that you made for us, we ask that you would lead us to praise, to thank you, and to bless you. We ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Redeemer. Amen. And hope to see you, or hope to have you tune in to our next uh, video Bible class, the, cre the creation of Adam and Eve. Goodbye for now.